from Seattle, Washington, it's theCUBE, covering AWS Imagine. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in downtown Seattle at the AWS Imagine EDU conference. It's the second year of the conference. Part of the public sector, kind of a carve out with Andrew Coe's group, really all about education. Um, and education from K through 12 to higher education, community college education, retraining of people coming out of the military. It's a huge segment and we're really excited to have our next guest. He's going to give a keynote uh, later this afternoon on a new paper that he just published. So we welcome Richard Palmer, the practice leader for public sector for Open. Richard, great to see you. Good to be here. So tell us, it's called Reaching for the Cloud. Yes. Look, what we found is that uh, for many universities, uh, moving into the cloud has proved to be difficult. That there are lots of barriers in the way and they get a part of the way along and all of a sudden they hit a wall and it takes time. The big number that we keep looking at is only 30% of uh, application workloads are in the cloud at this point and after six, seven years of the public cloud being available, it really suggests that uh, there are barriers, significant barriers right, there. Right. Mm. So what are some of those barriers? I mean, again, as you said, we've, we're, we're kind of well down this path, mm. so whether it's just mm. legacy stuff that's not worth moving, but I, I would imagine most of the new workloads are coming in. I mean, they've got to be getting with this program. Purchasing SaaS is, a, is an obvious ploy. Uh, it gets you right out of all of the problems that you had before. Look, the first thing that, that, that Barry, that people find is that cloud's different. So the skills that you've got in your team, the way that you work finances, your project methodologies, everything is different to engage with cloud uh, properly. Right. And it, the way that you design and build applications is different in the cloud. So taking a traditional organization trying to go cloud uh, has everybody involved from the CFO with funding cycles to governance boards which are the most wonderful thing ever in higher education. Right, right. Um, all the way through to staff skills and the way that staff think about uh, applications. And if there is one thing in my time in higher ed that I saw time and time again, it's the instant legacy problem. So somebody creates something and does it a special way because they know better than the vendor and we had this infrastructure anyway. Right, right. So why not reuse it? And they create an orphan that is neither manageable by the vendor nor manageable by the organization. Requires that individual to remain with the organization well well past their expiry date, let's right, put it right, that way, right. because they've, they've put things in that uh, are just unique to this single installation. And that's the transformation you see in the cloud. You know, it's software as a service, that's, it's a native thing, you don't look at how it's hosted, you don't care about anything but using it. But the danger point is in moving to infrastructure as a service or platform as a service, that you carry over that customization thinking, right. which creates, if you like, instant legacy. Right. Uh, so so that, that's one of the barriers that we see. I'm just curious, because you brought up two really big things, you know, just the whole financing and the way you buy it, the way you budget it is completely different than a big capital expenditure that you're depreciating over time. And then as you said, the skill set. So in the enterprise space, right, everyone's got big piles of money and they hire the big SIs, right, to come help them. They have instant <laughs> skills, they can bust them in um, by, by the mini, the dozens, and you know, help them with some of that financial engineering. How is the system integrator or the services kind of um, industry evolving in education to help them make this transition? Mm. So there are, there are two ways. And education being a public sector enterprise has that awful problem that if you provide advice, often you can't provide services. We tend to be getting over that a little bit now, but the obvious way is uh, most higher education institutions who've who've moved through that process have engaged a strategic partner to help them to plan. Right, so right. So that, that's the first piece. Um, and there, there are lots of them around, and uh, often they're very good, but moderately expensive. But uh, the thing that they don't tend to do as well is to find the right partners for the actual transition. Mm. So often, uh, engineers are trying to learn cloud technologies and apply them 
uh, and get it right the first time around. And of course we all know that in experimentation you want to have uh, learn fast and then uh, relearn when you've, uh, you've come to something that you shouldn't have done. Right. But if an engineer is thrown into a live production style project, there's no time for that uh, relearn, replatform, uh, you know, learn as you go. Right. So having it, uh, not so much an SI, but an implementation partner is really important. And luckily, many of the, um, the vendors or uh, their networks are really uh, quite good at doing those mid-level implementation projects now. Right. So it's a matter of finding the right one. Right. Uh, but certainly in my home um, Australian context, for almost all uh, moves to the cloud, there's somebody who's, who's done it several times before in education and has a good reputation. So I suspect in the US uh, that's multiplied. Uh, it's a 10 times larger right, economy. Right. There's probably 10 times as many people who've done it well before. Right. So the other piece that I'm curious if this came out, right? So there's the cloud as a more efficient way to run your infrastructure and, and all that that means and cost savings. But much more importantly, and some of the things we're hearing today mm. is really to enable innovation. Yes. To enable you to develop yeah. stuff faster, whether it's Alexa or, or some of these other things we're hearing about. I mean, how does that play in people, you know, kind of getting through the pain uh, of getting through this process? Because yeah. if you don't innovate, yeah. and we just had we just had somebody on before, he said that they're worried about competing with online yeah. and really having a good experience for the students on campus. Is that the driver? Is it the cost savings? Is it you know how do you how do you see that kind of slicing? We're seeing several drivers. The one that's most common is student success and retention. That is ubiquitous in higher education. Uh, to bring the cost down and to make sure that every intervention that the uh, college or school does is meaningful and produces a positive outcome. So that, that's kind of the core business and so things like analytics play into that and now machine learning more and more. Uh, but the motivator, yes there's the competitive motivator, but it actually works the same for their, their on campus as their online that if you can help every student to be successful, you'll gain reputation. Um, if you can do it efficiently, you'll, you'll drive down costs, so that's beneficial. Right. Um, but then, then you're asking about innovation. That's a step after you've put all the pieces together to do core business well. Right. And the key elements in doing core business well is shifting from traditional to agile, because agile projects have benefits on the business side as well as the technical side. One of the most important <laughs> things is to be able, in the agile space, is to be able to iterate quickly. And that is just as important on the academic side as it is on the technical side, because usually the academic or the administrative folks don't know what they need until they've actually experienced it. Most times when you're replacing a system, you ask the people on the front line what they want and they answer exactly what the last system did, right. but better. Right, right. Um, so that innovation cycle, um, you know, uh, do, then measure, and then uh, cycle through right. is part of the agile piece. And the second part of it is being able to differentiate between what is actually going to make a difference for your students and what is just pure whim. Uh, you know what, what we think might be better, but is actually going to cost, cost money, create legacy, move us away from standard practice, and actually is going to bring no benefit. So really important to attach real KPIs to differentiating practices, right. um, and get away from customization where it produces no benefit. The third element's platforms. Once upon a time we used to build our special systems from the code up, we shouldn't do that anymore. We shouldn't be caring about what database is underneath. Application platforms are faster, more effective, and require less in-house skills to maintain over, right. the, over lifetime. So that's, that's the third element. So one of the things that, that the enterprise has been able to benefit from is, you know, we just leave the ERP alone, right? Just, there's, there's a lot of stuff that's just not yep. worth lifting and shifting. But, you know, it's, it's kind of customer interaction applications and there's a whole kind of class of applications yep. that open up the opportunity to yep. leverage yes. uh, all these kind of platforms yep. and fast, yep. fast development, et cetera. Yep. 
how's that playing out on, on the on the public sector side? Because it, when we before we turned on the cameras, you talked about you know just the pain of lift and shift, and you run into all kinds of issues. You don't get that mm. that good easy win, that good fast win. Um, are, are, are they are they thinking in terms of you know setting aside kind of an innovation development team that's working on some of these kind of new age things that that aren't kind of the core systems that maybe you, you don't necessarily want to lift and shift anytime mm. soon? I'm a big fan of innovation teams when you're working directly with research. Not sure that that's uh, the best model for uh, mainstream innovation. It's much more useful to leverage the folks who are actually working directly with the business, people like business analysts, and to shift those into thinking beyond the mundane. Because um, the business analyst usually has a very intimate relationship in the nice way with their business partner and they can engage with what would make life better, what would make things more productive and then to quickly bring resources in behind that idea and do quick, quick proof of concept. But you've hit on another uh, whole issue there that the idea of a ubiquitous engagement layer that both delivers a really high quality online or uh, digital student experience but also provides a whole lot of information that can be then analysed to work out what was the best thing to do with the student is really transformative. And we're seeing the best vendors move into that space, even with traditional systems. And what they're doing, um, and I'll use a couple of student management system vendors as, as an example without naming them, but their traditional systems, they will either host them for you or you can do it on premises. But their new analysis engagement systems are cloud-based. Mm. So it doesn't matter where your uh, implementation is, you can buy a new software as a service that gives you really good in analytics and a new communications collaboration engagement layer, often with CRM and, and collaboration tools mixed in, in a brand new platform. And that's really transformative. So it allows you to keep your transactional system in place, but reskin it with a new engagement layer. And uh, if you can clip your university services into that engagement layer, then you get that 360 degrees view of the student with actually out having to shift major systems right and as you said uh, that's just money uh, spent to lift and shift a system because there's no strategic benefit uh, except if it allowed you to upgrade because so many uh, universities are stuck with an old version of a system either because they customized it or they haven't got the infrastructure to, to host the new version or whatever it happens right. to be so there is a strategic benefit to be able to stay with the latest version particularly as most good vendors are providing new features pretty regularly on their most up-to-date and are only doing maintenance releases for, for previous versions. Right. It's pretty interesting that Andrew pulled out of the, of the three mm. themes for the show, you know, tomorrow's workforce, role of ML, and innovation transformation. That, he, that, that ML got mm. its, own, its own bullet point. Yeah. Because it is mm. such a kind of an, an underlying uh, infrastructure that drives so mm. much value mm. across lots of applications. Yeah. And, and I just found it interesting that you kind of have to retrain academic institutions in the ways of big data mm. because it's very different than maybe the way that they you know, grew up thinking about yeah. data, the quantity and, and the way that you deal with it and how much yeah. you have and you know yeah. sampling of old data versus uh, versus all the real yeah. time flow so yes but the next generation is autonomous and whether it's self-driving cars or student advisement we're seeing the leading edge providers uh, provide uh, in the education space pretty much autonomous student advising now mm. except to the point where you go out of the mainstream but that rapid good advice from bots basically but when you get to the real world and autonomous systems we're going to see a real shift in even the university sector um, of that uh, interact with people and the environment um, if you're doing self-driving cars you're talking sub millisecond responses so that whole world of IOT plus sensing technology plus call it smart campus all coming together in the next iteration and being paralleled in the services and maybe even the academic world, that'll probably be a bit slower, but taking the same autonomous kind of uh, thinking and moving beyond just supplementing human, uh, human transactions. Right, right. 
All right. Well, Richard, thank you for uh, taking a few minutes. Good luck on your uh, keynote this afternoon, and we'll look forward to uh, digging into the paper. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right. He's Richard. I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE. We're at AWS Imagine EDU in downtown Seattle. Thanks for watching. See you next time.